This footage you're about to witness is absolutely insane and unlike anything I've ever seen before. On January 11th, 2024, near the Ukrainian city of Avdivka, videos surfaced of a pair of M2 Bradleys fighting it out with Russia's most advanced T-90M main battle tank. What really happened in this viral battle? And why is this location strategically important for Ukraine to defend? A quick disclaimer, miraculously, no one was killed in this footage, but viewer discretion is still advised. It's unclear if the Ukrainian Bradleys were actually hunting down the Russian tank, or if they just accidentally ran into each other. But in the interview with the Ukrainian Bradley commander, Seri, he indicated that the three Bradleys made the conscious decision to seek out the Russian tank. However, one of their vehicles had issues and was not able to effectively engage the tank. There was probably some technical problems, so it had to retreat. So they were down to just two brads. The close quarter engagement begins with the Russian 48 ton T-90M inside of this small village, with the first smaller Bradley initially engaging it from a 90 degree angle. Then both vehicles retreat away from each other. The T-90 we see here fires a cannon of 125 millimeter shot that misses, hitting the ground just a few meters in front of itself. Aiming at a target close to you in a tank becomes more difficult because you have to traverse the turret faster and objects will move across your line of sight faster due to its close proximity. Now on the 30 ton M2A2 Bradley, the turret can spin 360 degrees in about six seconds or 60 degrees per second. There are conflicting open source numbers on the T90 turret traverse speed, but the most often cited metric I see is about nine seconds to do a full 360 degrees or about 40 degrees per second. Things like turret speed that we don't often consider can be important when they're at their closest point that we observe, they're just 50 meters apart. This fight was essentially a ticking time clock for the T-90 because they had a very limited amount of time before the Bradleys would manage to knock out their optics and blind them. So it was a race against the clock for both of them. From what I could tell, the T-90 only had enough time to get off three cannon shots. The T-90 has a stabilized turret and autoloader that can fire on the move with up to eight rounds per minute. The T-90 backed away from the road intersection while blindly firing through buildings. The Ukrainian Bradley does the same thing here with its 25 millimeter chain gun firing dozens of rounds while flooring it along the road away from the tank. Now, geography always plays an important role in war, both on the strategic and tactical level. I believe the fight was geolocated to this town of Stepov which is only about 12 kilometers or 20 minute drive from the center of the Ukrainian city of Avdivka. This region has seen some of the most intense combat in recent months, with reportedly around 40,000 Russian soldiers attempting a winter offensive push here. Now, Stevpov is just north of Avdivka on its flank. If you wanna circle the major city, one of the places you need to go through is this village which is why Ukraine has made it the location of many of their ambush attacks, like this one with the Bradleys. There are conflicting reports on the ground about the current situation on who's winning here. It changes just about every day. Both sides claim that they're not giving up though, and it appears Russia has made some limited advances in the past month at the cost of a high rate of losses, both in equipment and manpower. Forbes reports that Ukraine's knocking out 13 Russian vehicles here for every one that they lose. But the consensus among most experts right now is that Ukrainian forces will have to fall back to a better defensive position in the near future. So that's why this location is strategically important, but what does the village tell us down on the tactical level? So we can see they have three main roads running east to west that armor can move through. These roads are about 1,000 feet long, then there's one road cutting through north to south that goes through half the streets. The whole town is like a circle or a loop that leads south to Avdivka. Most of the buildings are completely destroyed, but the rubble is going to be a major advantage for the Bradleys to fire and then duck and weave behind for cover. So the next thing that happens is the T-90M fires off a smoke canister, which is a textbook act to conceal its position and disrupt the thermal sights in the Bradleys. There are different perspectives on what exactly happened when the smoke was set off. It appears like maybe one of the T-90's explosive reactive armor pieces might have blown at about the same time, causing that large explosion that we see here. It could have also been from a misfire from the smoke grenade, I'm not entirely certain. This is when the second Ukrainian M2 Bradley crew retraces the steps of the first though, and gains visual contact with the Russian tank for the first time. 
they immediately start peppering it with chain gun fire. The Ukrainian Bradley operator Serhii spoke to the media about what was going through his mind at that moment, saying, quote, My heart properly went off. In training, I said to myself, God forbid I see a tank in my sights. But it so happens I did, and very close. The T-90 just eats up these direct frontal 25mm shots from the Bradleys, and from where we're standing, it looks like it's just simply absorbing those shots. But if we're sitting inside that T-90 tank hull, I cannot imagine how loud and terrifying it would be. It would sound like you're standing in a clock tower bell while someone's slamming it with a hammer. The Russian tank crew would have been extremely disoriented by the blasts, even if the chances of that smaller caliber round penetrating was very unlikely. It's easy to forget the human factor in these fights. So, how effective is the Bradley weapon against the tank? But before we get into that, the outstanding and detailed animation work in this episode is only possible thanks to our sponsor. I need to take a second to bring everyone up to speed on what's happening in the world of unmanned aircraft. General Atomics Aeronautical Systems, who you may know as the makers of the Reaper and Predator family of UAVs, has just unveiled its newest and most advanced family of unmanned combat aircraft, the Gambit series. Engineered to seamlessly integrate with manned air missions and human pilots, the Gambit series is built to fly ahead of formations to implement tasks and mission directives initiated from their manned counter parts. And in collaboration with other UAVs and manned aircraft, Gambit aircraft work together to find, fix, track, target, and engage targets to help commanders determine their best course of action. With the advent of unmanned aircraft and low observable jets in use around the world, it's important that we have the tools to detect adversarial aircraft that go beyond ground-based radar systems. When two or more Gambit aircraft work together to find and fix on a target, they give a human aviator the edge in early detection. Gambit is designed for production at scale and will ultimately reach endurance capabilities of more than 60 hours of of flight time through a revolutionary hybrid electric engine, letting US forces stay ahead in tomorrow's battle space. All right, back to the episode. How effective is the Bradley's weapon against the tank? It's equipped with the M242 25mm Bushmaster chain gun, which fires roughly 200 rounds per minute at the highest cyclical setting, which is the most commonly used setting. Inside the turret are two ready boxes, which feed the linked ammo into the receiver. This gives you the ability to fire two different types of ammo on the fly. That includes the M919 APDST, or Armor Piercing Discarding Sabo Tracer Depleted Uranium Round, and the M792 High Explosive Incendiary Tracer Rounds. We can see these munitions being placed on the ground by the crew during their interview. The M919 round was actually a controversial addition to Ukraine's arsenal, because depleted uranium Sabo rounds as opposed to your traditional tungsten sable rounds, brought about concerns about radioactivity, and this added capability was met with some controversy and protest from the Russian government. So the Bradley's anti-armor 25mm cannon round can penetrate between 30mm to 100mm of steel, depending on the angle at which the round strikes the target. However, the Russian T-90 reportedly has 400 to 900 millimeters of thickness of armor. These are open source numbers, so it could be different in real life. Uh, unlike rifle rounds, we can't easily go test military grade ammo on actual tanks on YouTube yet. But if those autocannon rounds are unable to penetrate the armor, how did they immobilize the tank? There are different theories. And I'll be the first to say I was not there, and we are only speculating here, but one potential reason is because the Bradleys were able to disable the optics on the Russian tank. The commander and gunner have their own optics located here on the T-90 tank. If you're able to hit them, then the crew is completely blinded and essentially combat ineffective in a lot of ways. While the 25mm rounds cannot pierce most of the T-90's armor, it is possible they struck a weak point where the turret connects to the hole, which KO'd the tank's turret rotation systems. Even though people know War Thunder for leaking classified documents, now it might have actually been known as the game that has a first confirmed kill. In the interview with the Bradley commander, Siri, they went on to say that his goal was to blind the tank using what he learned from playing video games. T-90Ms utilize the Sansa U sight system, located on the left hand of the gunner side and the AJAT MDT on the right for the commander in a CIV-like configuration. 
In the video, we can see the Bradley gunner firing multiple rounds at the top of the turret, with most connecting on or near the two sight systems. While the hull and main turret are heavily armored on the T-90, the sights are only somewhat protected and would be ineffective after only a couple of well-placed 25mm hits. This might be why we see the turret spin wildly before crashing into a tree. This could be what the Ukrainian soldiers are referring to when he mentions that he used his knowledge from War Thunder about where to strike the Russian tank. To me, this raises questions about what we're doing to make sure our armored vehicles in the United States have sufficient redundant backup optics so they continue to fight even if the main cameras are damaged. But there are many unanswered questions I still have, like, like why wasn't the tow missile used on the Bradley? In total, the Bradley has around 300 rounds ready to fire, split between one ready box that holds 70 rounds and another that holds 230. Open source numbers indicate an additional 600 rounds can be stored underneath the floor panels and maybe more if you don't have to fit an additional 5-6 infantry in the back of the hull. And my understanding is that there were no infantry in these Bradleys and only two crew driver and gunner, although I'm not 100% sure on those details. This means that depending on operational requirements, crews can mix and match the type of ammo that they want to go in the ready box, and switching ammo types is done simply by pressing a button on the center of the control panel. As capable as these rounds are, they were never really intended to be used against main battle tanks. Instead, they were designed to engage other IFVs, light armor, and infantry. Bradley crews are trained to use the three weapon systems on the vehicles for specific engagement types. The M240 coaxial machine gun is used against infantry, soft-skinned vehicles like trucks within 900 meters. High explosive rounds are for similar targets and structures past 900 meters. Sable rounds are for light armor, and the tow is reserved strictly for tanks but sometimes you need to improvise, adapt, and overcome with what you have available at the moment. One of the more interesting aspects of this fight is that during the entire engagement, neither Bradley crew fired that tow. While it's not obvious, they simply didn't have any loaded at the time, maybe they already expended the munitions, but it's unlikely a crew would go into a fight without the tubes loaded. In the interview with the Ukrainian soldiers who operated the Bradley in this engagement, they made reference to some problems that they had with their anti-armor capabilities. They likely didn't want to break operational security and go too into depth on what went wrong, but we can speculate as to what they might have meant. It could mean that they attempted to fire the tow launchers, but they failed to launch in the harsh environment. Could also mean that they ran out of anti-armor 25mm rounds and they had to use high explosive instead. There's also a theory that the tow missiles were not used because the fight was too close quarters for the munitions at a minimum arming distance that the tow has. I'm not 100% sure, maybe one of you guys could add some insight or possibly knows the answer, but in the interview we see the Bradley with a fully loaded tow and one without. So maybe one of them was fired. One of the biggest potential reasons we didn't see a tow fired is due to their biggest tactical drawback, that being that they need to be fired while stationary. And you don't want to be stationary when you're 50 meters from a tank. Tows have a range of almost two miles and are best used in situations where the Bradley isn't seen or detected by an enemy tank and ideally fired from as far away as possible. Compared to other weapon systems on the Brad, they're slow, taking several seconds before reaching the target, Due to their wired design, they're also susceptible to anything between the launcher and the tank that would get in the way, such as trees, electrical wires, even small patches of water are enough to disrupt the signal and cause it to completely malfunction. This particular Bradley had no luxury of time on its side, as the short distance visual engagement with the T-90 and debris surrounding it would have made it a tow shot incredibly risky and dangerous, making them an easy target for the T-90's smoothbore cannon. The chain gun, however, is computer stabilized, meaning that regardless of the Bradley or the tank's movement, the turret automatically adjusts the barrel to stay on target. This allowed them to continuously put rounds in the tank without having to stop. In the interview with the Bradley commander, Serehi said that he initially fired at the tank using their Sabo rounds, but then they started having some quote unquote issues, which could really mean they were having some feed malfunctions. So, not only did the Bradley not have the chance to use its tow, it lost the ability to use the only round type that had any actual hope of damaging any areas in the tank with armor plating. Enter probably one of the most famous lines to come out of this conflict, where Serehi said, Because I played video games, I remembered everything, both how to hit them and where. Using video games as a training aid is nothing new. American Bradley crews use a bunch of video games, like simulators, to provide as realistic training as possible, 
without the need to actually spend resources and money to practice their engagement skills. In fact, Bohemia Interactive, you might know them as the creators of the famous Arma series, are a major defense contractor, supplying the US military with the software used in all kinds of simulators. It's like getting people to work after they're out of work. Ukraine has currently deployed American-donated M2A2 ODS Bradley infantry fighting vehicles. It's important to note that these are older versions of the M2A3 currently in service with the United States Army. Infantry fighting vehicles, or IFVs, are primarily support vehicles for dismounted infantry. Their armor is only really heavy enough to protect the crew and passengers from lighter attacks like small arms fire, artillery shrapnel, and a few glancing shots from the 30mm on the BMP if you're having a particularly bad day. Even with the added ERA armor that we typically see them equipped with in Ukraine, one well-placed tank round, mine, or ATGM shot and there's a good chance that Bradley is going to be taken out of the fight. The Russian T-90M, on the other hand, is 100% a main battle tank, heavily armored with a large caliber cannon, designed specifically to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with other tanks, meaning an engagement with a vehicle that isn't even a tank should theoretically have been a walk in the park. But there were likely external factors that contributed to the T-90 getting knocked out. It might have been separated from its platoon, could have gotten lost, these are factors that we do not know outside the footage we see. That also has an influence on what might have happened. Maybe the T-90 was running low on ammo and conserving their shots, or had already taken some kind of damage from artillery that handicapped its performance here. This is why it's difficult to draw too many lessons or conclusions from this single engagement. As the Bradleys continuing to engage the tank, the crew conduct a rough form of what is known as a berm drill. Uh, fighting vehicles like tanks and brads use cover to protect themselves from incoming hits just like infantry do. The Bradley ducks in and out of visual cover between it and the T-90 in order to get shots on target without giving the tank a chance to engage it. This very event highlights some of the major design differences between Western and Russian vehicles. The T-90M at its core is an upgraded T-72 designed to be small, relatively cheap, and good for offensive maneuvers. This led to certain trade-offs in its design to fit that doctrine. Side and rear armor is particularly weak, and T-Series tanks are infamous for their slow reverse speeds, which greatly limits their agility during engagements like this. The T-90M contains an upgraded transmission, which affords it a reported reverse speed of 25 kilometers per hour, but this is still significantly slower than American equivalents, such as the M1 Abrams, that has a reverse speed of 40 kilometers per hour. This could be why we're seeing the T-90M remaining relatively still during the fight. Eventually, in an effort to provide some obscuration, the T-90 once again fires off another set of smoke grenades to conceal its exact position. At some point after receiving enough fire, the turret spins around uncontrollably, and the smoking tank hits a tree, followed by a direct drone strike before all three of the Russian tank crew abandon ship and run away to safety. The fact that the Russian crew survived actually tells us a lot about what might have happened inside the vehicle. The section of the tank that the turret connects to the hull is known as the turret ring. It's one of the most vulnerable parts of the tank to disable. Inside the turret ring are all the components that physically control and rotate the turret left and right. The T-90M typically has chain armor hanging around this area in order to protect it from RPG and ATGM strikes, but not smaller 25mm ammo which can pass right through. Any kind of serious damage to the electrical controls or connectors will cause a turret to spin uncontrollably like it did. There are different theories, of course, but I'm not sure I buy that this was a hydraulic issue since the turret is spinning at a constant speed. This means it's more likely an input disruption. If a hydraulic line had been hit, it probably would have caused the turret to seize up and stop altogether instead of spin like this. While the T-90 has still fought with auxiliary day sights after losing its thermals, there's not much you can do when your turret turns into the worst merry-go-round ever. Once turret control was lost, the crew would have had the option to switch the emergency manual control of the turret. But this method would have taken a massive amount of time that they didn't have, and near impossible to aim at that close a distance against a moving target. The combination of vehicle disabling followed by a final drone shot has been one of the hallmarks of this conflict, and potentially a big shift in armored doctrine in modern combat. One reason this particular engagement is noteworthy is because it's one of the rarer cases of direct armor-on-armor -armor combat that we've seen in the war. 
Most cases of vehicle losses on both sides have reportedly been from a vehicle disabled from mines, rockets, or artillery, followed by an ultimate knockout using drones or ATGMs. Just as how knocking out tanks has evolved in this conflict, how we learn to destroy them has as well. We should also keep in mind this is just one small battle, and Ukraine's success here isn't necessarily representative of the larger picture of what's happening in this area. According to the Ukrainian military, recently there has been as many as 78 clashes per day on these front lines here near Avdivka. Russian forces have reportedly been advancing along a key highway in the east of the town in early February 2024 in an attempt to encircle the town that has stretched on. This battle has lasted over two years. At this time, it's still too early to tell what the fate of the town will be. This type of battle is exceedingly rare, but we're starting to learn more recently how Ukraine is typically deploying the Bradley in most combat engagements. According to Donald Hill's analysis in his newsletter, linked in the description, Ukraine counterattacks with Bradleys raking the tree lines with 25mm cannon fire. Bradleys also transport small assault teams that clear out Russian stragglers from time to time. Once Stevpov and the tree lines by the railroad are clear, or mostly clear, of Russian troops, Ukraine pulls back to their functional defensive positions and waits for the next Russian attack. If you want to stay up to date on what's happening in this battle, follow me at Cappy Army on Instagram and Twitter. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. Please be sure to hit the like and subscribe button if you found this video interesting and you want this report to reach more people. And check out one of these videos if you have another minute. I'll see you again in the next report.